with uh, Catherine Johnson, improving the health of LGBTI plus people. Uh, what does early intervention mean in a landscape of social inequity? Uh, Catherine Johnson is a professor and director of Social and Global Studies Centre at RMIT and a visiting professor, Centre for Transforming Sexuality and Gender, University of Brighton, UK. And her research is in the field of gender, gender, sexuality and mental health with specialisms in critical community psychology and so, psychosocial studies I won't read all the rest of it, but thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm here today to talk about LGBT health, LGBT mental health. I'm a recent migrant to Australia. Um, I moved over in August, so most of my work is going to be talking about UK-based research, although I think there are many parallels to the kind of current situation in Australia. Okay, so I just want to start by, uh, I suppose, give a, a kind of broader social context to what we're talking about when we think about the health and the mental health of LGBTQ plus people. Uh, I am part of that community, and it's part of our history, our, our kind of queer kind of lives, our subjectivities, our sense of who we are that is completely wrapped up in a history of discourses of mental health high moral dramas about the Individual Sex Act and this dichotomous opposition between our agency, our choice, uh, and a sense of pathology, deviance, uh, and the epidemiology of risk. So that's a, a kind of a statement from um, David Halperin. And I want to use that as sort of trying to frame how we always come to think about the health and mental health of LGBT people. Um, uh, I quite like this... Um, uh, a newspaper article uh, where we say psychiatrists have switched their stand so homosexuals gain an instant cure because of course if we remember to actually be a homosexual was to be, to be diagnosed as having a mental disorder and what we've seen over the last 50 years is a shift from homosexuality itself being a mental disorder to uh, diagnostic uh, categories around being able to come to terms with your sexuality so if you found it difficult that you were, you were lesbian or gay then that was also a mental disorder, to now a kind of more, you know, broader concern about elevated rates of um, mental health issues, suicidal distress amongst um, LGBT populations, as well as, of course, um, health inequalities more generally. In my work, I've worked uh, very much in the field of LGBT mental health, but I also work around um, LGBTs, expe uh, people's experiences of palliative care, uh, LGBTs' experiences of... Um, basically interactions generally with healthcare professionals and the kind of impacts that that has on them. Uh, and as we'll see, whether or not those, those sorts of things shape the way that our health uh, does kind of unfold through the lifetime, because if those experiences are negative, it means that people are less likely to go out and seek help when they might need help for their kind of health. So I think we need to think about that this legacy of pathology, social stigma and shame are still very much implicated in how we come to understand some of those disparities that we see within LGBT health and mental health outcomes. Okay, just to say a little bit more about the epidemiology of risk, uh, we are an at-risk population. Um, we seem to be at risk within the kind of epidemiologies of HIV and AIDS around suicide, suicidal distress, uh, around depression. Uh, we, are, um, we have elevated kind of statistics in relation to smoking, uh, alcohol use, uh, obesity, particularly amongst uh, women. So lesbians are seen to be, uh, to be at health risk uh, in relation to their weight. Uh, we're around underweight, which actually is seen to be a health issue amongst gay men and also trans women. Um, we, are, we also kind of have significantly different kind of uh, uses of drugs, recreational drugs, and also a whole number of cancers uh, where we are at elevated risks of a whole number of kind of cancers. Um, just to point out some of those figures, so these are taken from the Australian context in terms of suicidality, LGBTI young people aged 16 to 27, five times more likely to attempt suicide in their lifetime. Transgender people aged 18 and over, nearly 11 times more likely to attempt suicide in their lifetime. Uh, in terms of um, kind of diagnostic categories in the kind of mental health uh, spectrum, uh, 
LGBT people um, feature very heavily in relation to diagnosis of depression and anxiety. Uh, just some st statistics here on depression. Uh, so nearly six times more likely to currently meet the criteria for a depressive episode. This is than the general population. And three times more likely to be diagnosed with depression in their lifetime. We find consistencies with these sorts of figures, you know, in, in most kind of countries where these kinds of... Um, uh, kind of national studies have, have been done, which do a comparison with the general population. So, what sorts of explanatory frameworks are available to think about these disparities? Well, uh, Meyer's model of minority stress is probably one of the best known. Um, where it talks about the impact of what, discrimination, bullying, isolation, and growing up in a family situation where you're not understood by your family. So Myers uses, I think, maybe in some ways a slightly clumsy comparison with if you come from uh, kind of an ethnic minority, where you may have experiences of racism, bullying, etc., but you have a family to go home to, to try to talk to, which can give some kind of protector. Well, one of the problems with Myers' model is he doesn't actually... Uh, certainly in the early work, didn't really think about those sorts of intersections that actually you can also, you can come from both types of family, you can come from a minority ethnic group and also be LGBT. But, but it does give a kind of framework to think about why people might start to develop issues with their mental health in the context of kind of uh, shame, bullying, stigma. Um, we also know that amongst young LGBT people, they are much more likely to experience precarious housing, homelessness, uh, which also then leads into kinds of elements around sexual exploitation. We find the sexual exploitation comes often also within queer communities where, where young people will turn up into a city which is perceived to be a safe place for young LGBT people to be, and, and actually without with having precarious housing, they end up couch surf uh, surfing, which can then lead to... Um, kind of STDs, drug use, etc. So, so there's a kind of sense of a vulnerability around um, a certain age group where, where for others within a general population they might be receiving more support um, uh, from a home environment at that kind of life transition point. Um, all of those sorts of things can have an impact on education and employment opportunities. Often young people come out at the time, uh, which is the time where at schools you're also doing exams and being assessed, which can make a big difference on your future opportunities. And then if they're not in a good environment in schools, then actually they can drop out of school or they don't attend enough. And then that has completely long-term implications in relation to their opportunities going forward for education, employment, uh, it then impact of you know, lifetimes of poverty which we also know has profound implications onto people's health. We can also think about some of the explanations for those disparities in terms of um, social, cultural and gender norms around health-related behaviour. So, so in this kind of sense, so lesbians are often seen as being kind of overweight uh, and that has an implication in relation to their health. Now, sometimes people might explain that in relation to discrimination, but it could also be seen in maybe a more positive way about not having to live within the norms of heterosexuality, which expect a kind of slim feminine body distinct from the kind of, you know, the masculine kind of Adonis body, etc. So there's a kind of freedom in that kind of sense there. So, so I don't want to just think about it all in a kind of negative light, but they do have implications, though, on the kind of on health implications, which is why we might where we find that lesbians are significantly more likely to to use kind of dangerous levels of alcohol, smoking, weight, sorts of things that perhaps historically we might have associated with men's health-related behaviour. Um, we also find that there's a kind of evidence that there's a failure to seek help in crisis uh, due to a kind of double stigma. So this kind of notion that actually uh, young people, we know that they leave it till, till things are really, really bad before they, they look for help. They don't ask for help at home. They don't ask for help at school. Um, they'll look online and it will often be when their, their mental health is in quite an acute state. Um, so basically in the explanatory frameworks, we're seeing a kind of mixture of things possibly related with lifestyle, uh, maybe some of those cultural norms associated with a hedonistic kind of uh, lesbian and gay culture, which can then long term lead to certain kind of health related problems. Uh, um, but they're also seen in relation to individual responses to dealing with inequality. So some of those things that, you know, that we, we might see as damaging for health in the long term are actually part of a coping strategy in the shorter term. Yeah. <sighs>
So in my work, I've worked with, um, I work with community organisations um, primarily. Uh, so an organisation I've worked with for probably over 15 years now is called Mind Out, uh, and they are uh, LGBT run for by um, LGBT people, mental health support, peer support kind of organisation. Now, because we know uh, statistically there's a lot of data around elevated rates of suicidal distress, um, we did some qualitative work with people living with suicidal distress around you know, what was going on in their lives at those particular times, but also what sorts of things in their lives might help them live with their suicidal thoughts and feelings. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of extracts in that kind of context of thinking about the relationship between health and mental health. So um, Simon, who did the keynote yesterday, will probably be pleased to know that we did find examples that physical activity can be a great coping kind of strategy for people who are living with suicidal distress and also substance misuse issues. So this is Christine. Uh, the project was we had, people took photos of things that they found helpful in and around their lives, but also how they sort of felt about their mental health you know, in the kind of everyday. So Christine says, it's what keeps me going at the moment. This is climbing. Uh, you have no option to be in the moment when you're climbing. You can't think about anything else. It's just a great way when your head's spinning. Everything is too much to shut it out. Whether you've got mental health issues or substance abuse issues, everything stops as soon as I start climbing. Uh, okay, so, and then this is the second one, who is Rome, which I think again shows some of that complexity about uh, the, the kind of the interaction really between health and mental health and about what counts as a kind of coping strategy. So here we have a photo of, of kind of alcohol. We have a photo which in, you know, of kind of medication, McDonald's. Uh, and basically Rowan's talking about this kind of um, ambivalence really about, you know, how, whether the antidepressants are actually helping, knowing that some of these things aren't helping, but actually it's part of that kind of everyday coping, things that people go to to reach to when, when, they're, when they're feeling terrible. Okay, so um, just to say a bit about trans-specific, um, so um, in Brighton and Hove, the, I mean Brighton and Hove is actually in some ways an amazing place to live if you are LGBT, it's very kind of equality driven and does a lot which is uh, in relation to supporting LGBT lives but it doesn't mean to say that those issues are not there. So there was a trans needs assessment done in 2015. Um, so we, um, it's quite a high percentage of the population are trans in, in Brighton. It's a place where people kind of move to. But we found that they're m more likely to have limited long-term illness or disability than the overall population, high level of mental health need, lack of knowledge about health screening, higher rates of smoking, lower rates of physical activity than the overall population, and less likely to use parks or open space. So again, if we think about that in terms of the interaction between... Um, yeah, if we think about that in, in terms of the interaction between health and, and mental health, if, you know, if people don't feel safe in public spaces, they're less likely to be physically active. So one, what can we do about those sorts of things? Well, one thing is that the city um, funded things like a trans swimming group. So this would be where this, the local swimming pool was closed to general public and, and you know and, and uh, once a week and it was a specifically for trans people to go along because uh, trans people often feel uncomfortable you know in their body in those sorts of situations in a general public situation fear, fears of transphobia etc so you know these sorts of initiatives are I think you know these are good interventions that can help people kind of in that in that who are living with mental health problems or, or, or suffering with kind of physical health issues to make them feel safe to maybe take some of those steps to kind of engage. But what I want to kind of point out is that whilst we have these kind of, in, these kind of interventions, this is always against a, back, a backdrop of kind of wider social stigma. So just to point out one of those things that's taking place at the moment in the UK. So I, do, I, I kind of uh, debated over calling it a moral... Uh, kind of a moral panic or public discourse, but uh, but basically it's both. But um, but but we've seen over the last kind of year or so, because in the UK there's a debate about the Gender Recognition Act going on, much the way that in Australia you had a debate about gay marriage. Um, it's become this very t kind of toxic kind of ground where where it's become a kind of polarisation of rights. So so 
which has had an impact really on how trans people can, can actually engage with physical activity. So, so, the, so it started at a kind of elite kind of public discourse around, you know, elite athletes saying that trans women would have a competitive advantage if they're allowed to compete in, in sport, which then filters down actually to, so the middle thing is um, David Lloyd, which is a kind of well-known gym ch chain, that actually was asking people to show their gender recognition act in able to, in able to use the changing room facilities. Um, so, it, it's this, so this kind of like proving who you are in relation to being kind of male or female. Uh, and then of course this makes it even more, uh, kind of less likely that, that trans people are going to try to kind of go out and exercise in those sorts of ways, which we then know can have long, longer term kind of implications in relation to their health and mental health. So that's just a sort of one example. Okay, another example. So I'm just, I've just begun with some colleagues um, at the University of Leeds uh, at Lancaster and Manchester. We've just, we've just received a lot of funding uh, from NIHR in the UK to do a national study which is trying to identify early interventions to improve the mental health of LGBTQ young people. As I said before, we know that they don't seek help from family. We know that actually they're most likely to go online or talk to their friends. Uh, so we're trying to actually map what services are available and which ones are seen as accessible and appropriate for young LGBT people so that we can then develop commissioning guidelines for how services should be delivered, which then might improve the way that young people, LGBT people with mental health problems will start to access services. So, I mean, and that's great. And, it, and it's amazing, you know, that we have got to a point where uh, those kind of health inequalities are being taken seriously and there is um, funding and hopefully funding afterwards to provide the actual services to try to make a difference for young LGBT people's lives. But I suppose in that kind of question about early intervention, one, one of the things that's come up when we talk to our community groups, our community partners, is about the age at which they think this early intervention should happen. So they're talking about that these, these things need to be available from age 12, okay? So, so we had originally thought Oh, you know, youth was looking at 16 to 25, but, but actually they, they want the interventions much, much earlier. And I guess there's that sort of question about, well, what does it mean then to intervene earlier and what are we intervening in, okay? And these are the sort of broader social questions, I think, which are important for us to always think about. So second moral uh, panic or public discourse, which again you've had here in Australia, is about what happens in school situations when we're talking about LGBT lives, okay? About whether they're seen as equal, as valid. Um, so we've just had a very um, public um, debate about a school in Birmingham where they were delivering um, uh, in their kind of sex education lessons, they were delivering um, LGBT focused kind of understandings. These are, this is a primary school. It's not actually about the sexual act between same-sex people, but it's about having examples where there are two mums or two dads, or it's all fairly conservative, really, within the sort of family model. But anyway, there was a, a very large protest. Many parents stopped sending their children to school. The lessons are cancelled. Um, and, you know, but as we see, the public discourse, discourse also shows that there is this understanding that lives are ruined by shame and stigma, that LGBT lessons in schools are vital. And if we think about the history of, of kind of LGBT mental health and its kind of connections with, with living through those sorts of contexts where you learn from a very early age that you are not an acceptable thing, or you don't see those kinds of models of those lifestyles around you, we have to see that as part of the problem of why there are these elevated rates of, of health and mental health issues. Okay, so um, to kind of put that into some broader question then, what might an early intervention look like? And I mean, I suppose in some ways I'm sort of straying into the ground of what might prevention look like. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and I think we'll probably hear a bit about that more in the next talk. But um, so I would like to say that it is, you know, I think it's brilliant that we are finally seeing governments invest money in doing research about services for LGBT people. 
that we do access services in different ways, we do feel comfortable in different ways where our sexuality isn't seen as the problem, um, but it is also acknowledged in a way that makes people feel comfortable and relaxed. So it's really good that money's being put into that, but it is still very much, I think, that individualistic approach. It's about fixing something that maybe didn't need to be broken in, in the first place. Um, so social, a social intervention could be earlier, um, and it could be actually about transforming those scripts of shame and stigma that are associated with queer lives and then entrenched in us long before we know we are that thing. And I think that's from my experience of working around suicidal distress with young people and, their, and seeing that kind of their utter terror when they've been bullied at school for being gay and haven't been able to tell anyone that this bullying is happening because they're frightened that they might be that awful thing that people are saying that they are. So, so it's, you know, that we've, we've got qualitative evidence which really demonstrates how these things become entrenched in somebody's kind of psyche. So, you know, and in order to have this type of social intervention then, then really we need the action of friends, siblings, parents, teachers, therapists and healthcare providers to challenge that normative, the normative situations that enable homophobia and transphobia to persist. And I think that's particularly the case in families. So, so what we saw in the UK was a lot of people protesting, it's too young, it's too young for my child to hear about LGBT kind of like relationships because those parents didn't for a moment imagine that their child might be that person who grows up to be gay. And, and you know, Twitter's a, you know, a terrible thing and a wonderful thing, and you can find some great kind of tweets in relation to some of the things that came out, some very supportive things. So, um, and this one, he's from, um, he's a, a very well-known comedian in the UK, and he said, I would love my son to be taught about LGBT issues in schools so they don't grow up to become the sort of narrow-minded pricks that don't want LGBT issues taught in schools. And those are the sorts of things about that kind of, the way that allies can, can kind of... Um, you know, stand by and create those sorts of changes. And I'd just like to conclude with a happy note that in the last couple of days, that there was a debate in Parliament in the UK. It went much better than any of the Brexit debates, which don't seem to have any kind of resolution. But it was unanimously uh, approved. I think only about 20 MPs voted against it. So over 500 MPs voted for that there should be LGBT, inclusive sex and relationship education from primary school. Okay. Thank you.